to the first verse now? Yes. Okay. Pretty we. Priti vite yata kata dharma nam ekshale bhagavata kahe shava pari purna chale As indicated in Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, first chapter, second shloka Dharma, Projita, Kaitavatra <coughs> That is that second shloka, very beautiful shloka All the philosophies on the earth that are celebrated as dharma are utterly deceptive That is an incredible bombshell, you know, for most people when they're following what they consider a religious dharma and they're suddenly told in the very first line of the Fal Shruti they're utterly deceptive because they're not pointing on transcendence they're pointing on making something happy here in the material temporary world so therefore they're actually useless and ultimately they're deceptive I mean it really is a power pack straight off the bat you know that all these dharmas we hear at the end of Bhagavad Gita, Sarva Dharma Paritya Man, give up all these dharmas and just surrender unto me. This is like the same principle. Give up all these dharmas and just surrender to me. And that third chapter we've said many times, Naimitic Dharma should be relinquished. So this um, vocabulary of Jaiva Dharma is a little different to Bhagavad Gita, a little bit different to Srimad Bhagavatam, but still the same exact conclusion is being given. The sages and sadhus, they want us out of this material conception. We're sunk in a covering of Maya for so many lifetimes, and these divine grunters will raise our consciousnesses because the soul, the symptom of the soul is consciousness. So to come out of those lower stages, grades of consciousness, requires direction. The direction comes from Shastra. And first thing it's saying, all these other dharmas are useless. Trying to do this, trying to do that, anything to do with the material. Unless Guru has ordered, build a temple, you have nothing to do with the material activities particularly. Everything is being focused on developing your sambandha with Krishna, that channel of affection, then it's almost like we're in the spiritual world. We just were reading chapter 16 before you came in with Hong Kong. And the nature of the relationship in the spiritual world is described as love alone. Nothing else exists except this love for Krishna. So to find that place in the heart and it has to be genuine of course you can't uh, be deceptive about it otherwise it won't reach the heart the heart is by nature there's a place within the heart of absolute purity and reality that's the consciousness of the soul and when these um, absolute truths are woken up if it's the truth It'll, we could say in English, resonate. It'll resonate with your soul. And that resonating opens up many other doors in the consciousness of inquiry. And as soon as you start to inquire about different topics, the answers are always there because Bhagavatam gives all of these answers. There's absolutely nothing missing from the Srimad Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Charitamrita, these two grunters and Jaivadharma together. So all these dharmas must be rejected, relinquished, is the language. Chala dharma chadikara satya dharma mati chaturvargya tyaji dara nitya prema gati One should completely abandon such deceptive dharmas and observe his mind in true dharma. In other words, one should give up the fourfold goals of material life, dharma, arth, kam, moksha and aspire solely for the ultimate destination of Nitya Prem. Where you've just come from in the south of India, they have this Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha hanging around their necks. You know, they're so embedded in these four principal Dharmas of life. Actually, not just where you're coming from, the whole of India, which is a very Dharmic land. I and mean, we can't even talk about the West. They don't have any Dharma in the West, basically. It's, not, it's just vacant. 
But here in India, you have this dharmic land, but it consists of these four types of dharma. So straight away, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he's attacking the root, saying your root conception of finding satisfaction in this temporary material world is absolutely useless. That there's nothing here of value. Why are you wasting your time looking for religiosity in this world? It's, it's empty. Amitva manam sa brahme nicha jade budi nirvishesha brahma gyan na hichita shudi. Those who are deluded identify themselves with matter. That is their error. However, one cannot be purified of such delusion by endeavors for nirvishesh brahma gyan. If you endeavor for nirvishesh brahma gyan, it's like you go back to where you've come from. We've come from the brahma jyoti. That's where the jiva was originally when he was manifested by Baladev Prabhu, Sankarshan, Mahasankarshan. Three types of jivas, the jiva in Goloka Vrindavan, the jivas in Vaikuntha, and the jivas in this world. And all these jivas are manifesting, first of all, the first jiva by Baladev, second by Sankarshan, and third by Mahasankarshan. All coming like that in a line. So we have manifested from that place, the Brahma Jyoti. And to want to go back there is very common for many people, this impersonal path. That's why there are so many impersonal schools, because we've already been there. We have an impression of that impersonal reality, because we've just come from there. So there's some attraction. It's not, not strange for us to consider Yes, I am one with the light. And there are so many schools. And Shantaras is the place I want Shanti. You know, this is the place that I'm like. All the alternative spiritual paths talk about that, certainly in the Western world. Yeah. In this country, they also talk about it in this country. So much, the yogis, mystics, these people. But true Dharma, that's a different thing. The Mayavadi thinks Sri Krishna to be sub subject to the limitations of time, such as birth and death, and considers that he is not transcendental. Thus, he rejects Sri Bhagavan's Vichitrata, astonishing characteristics, paraphernalia, qualities, and Leela. Through this vicious attempt, he is left with the philosophy of Nirvishesh Brahm. If we ignore Krishna's divine qualities, where is the juice? Really, think about it. When we think of all the millions of descriptions of the beauty and speciality of Krishna's pastimes, his nature in his loving pastimes in Vrindavan, his Chatriya pastimes in Dwarka and Mathura and on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. Such amazing personal qualities have been exhibited and to completely ignore those, what are you giving up? It's like you're giving up life, isn't it? For this Nirvishesh experience. So it's horrible. So it's saying the word is here, Dismember, I think it says. What does it say? The next. Oh, in the next one. Yeah, in the next one it says, such base and contemporary gyan. Well, we just read the next one today then. Kanda gyane hoya dharma ache sunishchaya prakriti hoile kavu aprakrita noya. Such base and contemptible gyan, which arises out of an attempt to dismember the divine form of Bhagavan, is only fit to be rejected. It is prakrita, materialistic, and should never be given credence as aprakrita dharma. Credence. Or credit. Credence, yeah. Yeah, so you take away the qualities and you... That's hurtful for Krishna to take away those qualities. It's, it's horrible. Okay, so we're back into chapter 8. This is where we're up to in 
our reading here. So, yes, we came down, we stopped yesterday when the storm stops us at a description of the Madhyam, page 168. This description of the Madhyam, we already discussed the Kanishta, Kanishta, that person without Nishta. He doesn't really have faith. He might perform different activities, look like a devotee. So it's very helpful to have these descriptions of the nature of such personalities. Then we know who to associate with. And we it's not like we're having to make judgments, but we should know what is beneficial for our own progress. If I'm associating with Kanishtas all the time, and are understanding their level of inferior consciousness, then it's going to be difficult, unless I'm teaching them, uh, unless they're listening to me, then actually they are following the Madhyam. And my Gurudev said, I told you yesterday, that we should very quickly come to this Madhyam stage. Don't linger in the Kanishta stage. This Kanishta stage is not um, conducive at all. It's the Prakrita, it's the worldly devotee. So we should quickly jump out of that. So now these are the descriptions of the Madhyam. So Srimad Bhagavatam 11.246 describes the behavior of the Madhyam Vaishnava as follows. Ishwari tar apineshu balisheshu vasat shu cha prema maitri kripa peksha ya karoti sa madhyama. So these are the qualities of a Madhyam. A Madhyam Bhagavat is one who loves Ishwara. We start with that. You have at least some type of Sambandha, at least some type of faith that that Ishwara, Supreme, is not me. Yesterday we were asking, she was asking questions about this Pratibhimba. Pratibhimba is the reflection, right? This is what we discussed here. It doesn't have a connection with the object. Chaya is okay because it has a, re has a connection with the object. It, so if someone is in a mood chanting Pratibhimba, it means they want something for themselves rather than they are actually wanting something to please Krishna. This actually is a quantum leap of appreciation because most of in our materially contaminated condition when we first come to devotional service, we are still wanting so many things for myself. I want to be happy. And my only understanding of happiness is in the material world because I haven't experienced happiness in the spiritual world. So I don't know anything else. So I want to have a nice house, a nice wife, a nice family, a nice job, a nice money, even though I'm wearing tilak wearing a devotee and, you know, trying to surrender to Krishna. I still want all these material supports along the way because I haven't actually relinquished that material conception of happiness yet. I haven't understood my love for Krishna. So this is the first quality of the Madhyam. Ishwari, he understands the Madhyam Bhagavat is one who loves Ishwara. I want to go to Krishna's dharma. I want to go to the places where Mahaprabhu um, worshipped, where Mahaprabhu lived. I want to see that house of Sachi Matra and Jagannath Mishra. I want to see that place in the Ganga where he bathed. I want to go to Nishingapali. I want to go to um, Hariharak. I want to go to all these places where there's a, an impression in the atmosphere of Krishna. I want to, I, I'm eager to, to go and get that purification from being in those places. Because if I live anywhere else on the planet, outside of Vrindavan or Goradam or Purushottam, Nilachal, then where am I going to get that purification in a strong form? Maybe I'll go to some temple in some different places and get some impression. But the powerful impressions that most of us need in Kali Yuga are in Vrindavan Dham and in Goradam and also Puri Dham. But most conducive for this age is actually Gorodam. Why? Because it's most munificent. It's described 
that even lying down, taking rest, here in Navadvip Dham, is considered that you're offering Dandavat Pranams, you're offering obeisances. In Vrindavan, it's a little more strict, or quite a lot more strict. The beauty is practically even more tangible, because it's more uncovered just now. You can go to Govardhan, you can go to Radha Kund, you can go to Surya Kund, you can go to Varshana, you can go to all of these beautiful holy places, and see directly, you know, the where the pastime places were of Krishna. But here in Gorodhan, it's much more covered. But with prayer and the mercy of Mahaprabhu, then it all becomes revealed, because it's described that in this age, this dharma of uh, Mahaprabhu is going to become uncovered. Already, Vrindavan is uncovered, and it's becoming covered. How is Vrindavan becoming covered? Just more and more materialistic. Yes, right. Even the mafia. Mm. Everything is there in Vrindavan town. Mm. Packed full of rubbish. Mm. You know, wireless everywhere. You know, everything. It's, it's a crowded city practically now. Yeah, so it, that's the covering. When you go to Govardhan, the covering's much, much less because people don't live in Govardhan. They just go to Govardhan generally for Parikrama. So there's many Dharmshalas in Govardhan. There's no, you can't even buy a pair of spectacles in Govardhan. You have to go to Mathura. You, you know, the infrastructure of Govardhan is not a city or even a town. It's a place of pilgrimage still. And it's described that if one lives close to Govardhan in the age of Kali, Kali Maharaj can't inflict punishment on you in the region of Govardhan. He has no strength. Kali Maharaj, when you live in Govardhan, around Govardhan, as long as Govardhan exists, which is also temporary because he's sinking every day, one mustard seed is sinking, I've seen in my lifetime, in 40 years, I've seen him go right down. So it's a reality that he's going. So when he's gone, disappears from our sight, there'll just be a, like a hole, and people will still always will be circumambulating. But the um, amount of space that you can have, which is free from Kali, is going to be reduced. So now like that. But this faith can be very quickly built by residents in the holy dams, by Gauradam and by, uh, Vrindavan. This faith in Ishwara. Welcome, welcome. I didn't want to stop because we're recording. Happy to see you both. <clears throat> Amadhyam Bhagavad is one who loves Ishwara, is friendly towards his bhaktas, shows mercy towards those who are ignorant of bhakti, and neglects those who are inimical to Ishwara or his bhaktas. Loving his bhaktas is very important. This is the distinction between the Madhyam and the Kanishta. The Kanishta doesn't understand that Krishna is in the heart of every jiva. He doesn't understand that all devotees should be honored and worshipped. This is what he doesn't understand. Now we come to the Madhyam. The Madhyam is the mature stage. Out of, it means you're actually a devotee. And this is why my Gurudev said, quickly come to the Madhyam platform. We should be quickly coming to the... Don't play around with um, uh, doubtful conceptions of Krishna. Have Your faith should be strong. Shraddha Shabde Vishwasa Koi Sudrita Nishchoi. Our faith should be confident and strong in the reality of God, the reality of Krishna. God is a general word, like if you talk about a forest of trees, it's quite impersonal, isn't it, when you just say trees, but if you say a jackfruit tree, a banana tree, an apple tree, then it's got quality. So when we say Krishna, that means he has quality, because you've given him a, a name, a personality, a form, and then you start to consider all those four, or aspects, qualities of Krishna, and then spiritual life becomes so exciting it becomes so beautiful because you're looking at all these amazing transcendental qualities of krishna and that's helping you to love krishna more to worship krishna more especially his pastimes in vrindavan 
and there focusing on Krishna with Mother Yashoda, Nanda Baba, etc. And then with the cowherd boys, all the pastimes they perform, Bakasura, Pralambasura, Agasura, the demons that they kill. And then with the gopis, you go even deeper conception into Krishna's Kishore age. So each time, each stage, it's bringing us into a closer proximity, closer um, appreciation of Krishna. So this is, a, this is our journey. And then, of course, if you come to Gauradam, then it picks up a whole nother atmosphere. Because here, all of a sudden, you have Radha and Krishna in the one body. You have the golden mountain, the golden avatar of Mahaprabhu, exhibiting the complexion of Sri Radhika. But inside, he's Krishna. And what is he doing in Navadvip? He's acting something like Sham. He's showing his different avatars. He's showing Nishringa avatar to Srivas. He shows his Varaha avatar to Murari Gupta. He shows the universal form to Advaita Acharya. This is what he's doing here. When he's met his Ishwara Puri, his spiritual master, when he comes back from Gaya. So all of these pastimes are very wonderful because the Parikas love Mahaprabhu. They love him from birth so much. With his brother Vishwarup, they have so much affection for Mahaprabhu. So we're getting a whole nother, a different um, uh, picture of the Supreme Lord as Mahaprabhu. This is very tasty, very sweet to appreciate and the heart to absorb. Ideally, for the sadhak, the best method is to actually spend time in Vrindavan and know who is Krishna in Vrindavan and then come to Gorodha. Not necessarily you have to do like that, but it's it's a, a simple way because then you're understanding Krishna and the gopis. And then you're coming here and you still understand Mahaprabhu. How, how is he with the gopis? Because he is blessed with this bhav of Sri Radhika, which we will see become manifested at the Godavari in his conversation with Rai Ramananda. That's when it actually comes out. And then when he goes to Puri for the last 18, 12 years of his life, that's when he is experiencing that Mohanakya Mahabhav, that separation mood to the highest, and sometimes a little bit Madanakya Mahabhav. But most of the time when Mahaprabhu for the last 24 years of his life, he's, he's not like Sham anymore. He's like Sham when he's here in Nabadweep. And this is very beautiful for us to appreciate. But we have to know who is this Sham. And you find out who is this Sham from being in Vrindavan. You can reckon, like here in Nabadweep, he's friendly with the weaver. He's friendly with the potter. He's friendly with the milkman. He's friendly with the cloth man. He's friendly with the man who sends the, the, the conch shells. He has all relationships with all these different people in Navadweep. Very beautiful relationships. Then he has the relationships with his two wives, Lakshmi Priya and Vishnu Priya. All of this beautiful um, pastimes that he performs. And then he comes into his devotee mood after he's met Ishwara Puri in Gaya. Then everything really blossoms out as a devotee. But then he can't remain here because he remembers why he's actually come. He's come for those three reasons. Sri Radhaya Pranaya Mahima Kidrisho Vanaiva Swadhyena Buddha Madhurima Kidrisho Vanaiva Sokyam Kasyam Mad Anubhavita Kidrisho Vanaiva Tad Bhavadi Samajami Sachi Garabu Sindhu Harindu He's come to experience Radharani's greatness. He's come to taste his own sweet qualities that only Radhika perceives. And he's come to experience or relish the happiness that she feels by tasting the sweetness of his love. These three desires should be engraved in our consciousnesses if we're living here. Why is Mahaprabhu here? He's here because he wants to fulfill these three desires, but he doesn't fulfill them here. This is the prelude. Isn't it? Not even one. Huh? Not even one. 
to some degree in the Ras Lila, which is performed in Sriva Sangam. In Sriva Sangam is where the Ras Lila begins. But he's proclaiming himself as Sham. He sits on the throne and he tells everybody's previous births. In the Sat Praharya, um, what's it called? Sat Praharya, the 21 hours Kirtan, Sat Praharya Krita. Mm. Then he's sitting on the throne and he's putting all the shalagrams on his lap. He's saying, I am he, I am that one. So that's a sham mood. That's a Krishna mood. That's not experiencing the ba. But my Gurudev has explained, within those rasa, because they go on for one year. Because Vrindavan is the same as Navadweep. A Navadweep could not be Vrindavan unless the Raslila was here. So the Raslila must be here in, in Navadweep. So the Raslila takes place during those kirtans at Sri Vasangam. For one year those, Shri, those kirtans go. Those night-long kirtans go in Sri Vasangam. And my Gurudev explained, at that time, Mahaprabhu experiences this Madanakya Mahabhav in that Kirtan Ras. That Kirtan Ras, when that's performed, he experiences, he touches on it, but it doesn't go to the same depth because that, it's called Saki Bhav. Saki Bhav means the mood of the Saki. That means the mood of Sri Radhika. That is only really brought to his consciousness fully when he meets Rai Ramananda who is a Saki herself, Vishaka. So she gives him this Saki Bhav. Without the Saki Bhav, he's not really able to fully, something internally he's experiencing here in Navadweep. He's experiencing, my Gurudeva, strife full Madanakya Mahabhav during that Ras Lila. But the Mohan and the Modam, these moods of separation, which are the same height of ecstasy as the modern. Modern is the meeting. Modern is meeting, then those eight blazing sattvika bhavs, that is modern akya mahabhav. And then modern, mohan, these are the ruda and adi ruda. These are six, uh, eight blazing sattvika bhavs also. So both of these are the same in meeting and in separation. You understand? We want to go to the limit of our consciousnesses with um, appreciating who is Mahaprabhu. This we really want to try to um, capture. And like I'm sharing that the... Um, welcome Prabhu. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You give him a book. <clears throat> we start at five o'clock, by the way. And uh, we finish at 6 o'clock, regardless of who comes or who doesn't come. I'm just going to speak for one hour, and then I'll stop at 6. Yeah, sit in a chair, most comfortable. Okay, so Vrindavan and Navadvi see their interrelationship with Krishna and Sri Radhika. See how they are exactly the same, and how beautiful and sweet they are. Because the appreciation of this sweetness and beauty is what is going to impact the heart more than the tattva. The tattva will purify the consciousness. Absolutely essential. But the heart also has to be ignited. Unless genuine affection is manifesting. We just said the description, the Madhyam Bhagava is one who loves Ishwara. So how to love this personality that we don't see with our material eyes? We can see Takoji with our material eyes. We can see the Vaishnavas with our material eyes. We can see the Dham with our material eyes. But when we want to spiritualize our vision, we have to see beyond the material. That means I have to give up my material desires and connection with this matter, this material world. Right? That's what we said at the beginning when we were chanting the Falshruti. I have to give up all these material dharmas. Why? So I can come to Krishna. I can't come to him if I'm carrying all this luggage of these dharmas. How can I come to him? He says, put those dharmas down, then come to me. Come to me with full transcendental hunger and greed. And then we can connect. 
So I have to reject all those dharmas. The behavior being described here is classified in the realm of Nitya Dharma. Yes, now we're in the Madhyam level. This is Nitya Dharma as opposed to Naimitika Dharma. Naimitik means temporary. Even many of the Leelas in Krishna's pastimes are Naimitik. Kangsa is Naimitik. The demons manifesting are Naimitik. In the spiritual world, they have a conception of these demons. They have a conception of Kangsa, but it's not a reality. But in Brahma Vrindavan, the reality of those demons is there. And the Nitya Siddha Parikars, they relish these pastimes with the reality of that Naimitic, those Naimitic Leelas. But nevertheless, we should know clearly they are Naimitic. And what is Nitya in Krishna's pastimes? The Ras Leela is Nitya. The pastimes with the gopis is Nitya. So our path is to follow in the footsteps of the Brajadevis, because that is the eternal realm. So we're always trying to bring the consciousness to the moods and speciality of the gopis. Rag Mag Bhakti Loke Karite Prachan. Mahaprabhu has come to give us Raganuga Bhakti. He hasn't come to give us Vaidhi Bhakti. That was given previously. That could have been given by Advaita Acharya himself. He didn't have to call Krishna to give Vaidhi Bhakti. Right? He's come specifically to give Ragmag. So this is what we're trying to appreciate. This is when you come to the level of Madhyam. I'm not referring here to Naimitic Dharma, temporary religious or worldly duties. The behavior that I am describing is part of Nitya Dharma and it is essential in the life of a Vaishnava. Yes, to know what is Nitya Dharma. Essential. This is what the very first lesson in Bhagavad Gita is to understand in the second chapter the distinction between matter and spirit. And throughout our practice, even when you're an old devotee, you still have to fully, deeply appreciate this distinction that I am spirit soul, that I'm not the material body. This has to go on again and again and again and again and again. Because Maya Devi is so thick and so strong. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada was crying one time in front of some deities in America. I think it was Detroit, someone like that. And the devotees asked, why are you crying? You know, why, why are you praying so fervent? What are you praying for? And Prabhupada turned to the devotees and said, I'm praying that Maya Devi won't attack me. And they were shocked. How can Maya Devi attack you? And Prabhupada told the devotees, you don't know how strong Maya Devi is. She is so powerful. In an instant, she can distract you from this path. Especially today. For just think, for example, we all have these cell phones. You go on the cell phone, perhaps you're going with the intention of listening to a Prabhupada recording or reading, and then all of a sudden you see a half-naked woman somewhere. Boom! You press that button and go straight down that track. Within a second, you can be captured by some distraction. Cows are confirming. <laughs> okay. But just appreciate how strong is Maya. So that's what hijacks us. The behavior that I'm describing is part of Nitya Dharma. And it is essential in the life of a Vaishnava. Other types of behavior that are not opposed to this behavior may be accepted where necessary. So that's called Sangha Siddha Bhakti. Sangha Siddhi Bhakti is when the good qualities can be supportive, but not by themselves do they constitute Swarup Siddha Bhakti. Swarup Siddha Bhakti is the principle. Swarup Siddha Bhakti is Shuddha Bhakti, pure, Ananya, Kevala. But Sangha Siddha Bhakti, like a rope Siddha Bhakti, Rupa Goswami still calls it Bhakti because it has a semblance of Bhakti there. It can support us on our journey. Good qualities. But good qualities will naturally arise in the sadhak anyway. We never ever have to cultivate those separately. 
just our nature as devotees, as soon as you come close to Krishna, as soon as you come close to really serving, desiring to serve Krishna, all of these good qualities are just going to flow into us. Because they're already there in embryo, within, just waiting to manifest. And we are so much more satisfied when we are walking in our good qualities. If you're walking around being kind to everyone, generous-hearted, truthful, etc., honest, you're naturally going to be feel blissful, right? So this means that I listened to a Gurudev um, clip a couple of days ago. He said, if you're not happy, you're not really a devotee. Because happiness consists of the mode of goodness. So you're not really a devotee unless you're happy. And being happy means that your generous heart, all these qualities are there coming from you. So this is the nature of a pure Vaishnava. He will have these qualities. You understand? You can ask me any questions as I'm going on. I'm just rattling along. Anything that you feel obliged to stop on, you can ask me. A Vaishnava's behavior is directed towards four categories of individuals. Ishwara, Supreme Lord. Tad Adina, his bhaktas. Balisha, materialistic people who are ignorant of the spiritual truth. And Dvesha, those who are opposed to bhakti. So four distinct, this is what the verse is saying. Ishwara, Tad, Abhineshu, Baleshu, Shu. A Vaishnava shows love, friendship, mercy, and neglect, respectively, to these four kinds of individuals. In other words, he behaves lovingly towards Ishwara, with friendship towards the bhaktas, and mercifully towards the ignorant, and neglects those who are inimical. Don't waste your time with people who are inimical. Don't even waste your energy or your breath. If someone... We are looking for what sort of association? This, um, uh, what is it? Swajatya, Shnigda, Ashraya. Swajatya. Swajatya means what? Jat. Swa, own jat, own group. Those people who have the same ultimate conception that we have. Where do you want to go in your meditation? Oh, I want to go with the gopis. I have heard from Guru that ultimately Mahaprabhu has come to give Manjari Bhav. Yes, I want to be those with those people who believe in this conception of Mahaprabhu, that Mahaprabhu has come to give Ragmag. Yes, that is my jat, Swajatya. And then Shnigda. What does Shnigda mean? Affectionate. They are affectionate to us. They don't ignore us. They don't blank us. They are affectionate to us. And then Ashray. We always feel they are senior to us. That is the best association. So we are seeking that company. Anyone who doesn't come into that company, why waste your energy? We're only here for a few short years left. How many years do we have in these? From one perspective, it seems like a long time. But from the overview, it's just a matter of seconds, basically. It's very, very brief, our time here. We don't really have time to... Um, speculate or to go to other places, you know. We have a lot of ground to cover. I was just reading today about Srivas Pandit and he was so well versed in all the scriptures and I was thinking how wonderful it must be to be well versed in all the scriptures, to know all the scriptures, you know, to have gone into the scriptures, to feel strong within the scriptures to know all the different references because they're all the scriptures are given to us by the sages to help us get out of this material covering so if you if you take great happiness in the scriptures it means you're actually taking great happiness in your journey towards krishna right if you love to read the shastra it'll give you nourishment it'll give you strength it'll paint a beautiful picture of krishna for you to um, hold in your heart and embrace and follow. So, being a pundit of Krishna is something very wonderful. So, how much time do we have? 
for any other activities. One, the first characteristic of a Madhyam Vaishnava is that he has Prem for Sri Krishna, who is the Supreme Lord of all. The word Prem here refers to Shuddha Bhakti. Okay, that's interesting what you were saying the other day. So you were asking about Prema Bhakti and Shuddha Bhakti. So I was saying that Shuddha Bhakti is more general. But here it's saying that Prem is referring to Shuddha Bhakti. So you can see it like that. You can see Prem is within Shuddha Bhakti. Whose symptoms have been described as follows in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu Bindu. And Yabilasita Shunyam Jnana Karmadi Anabritam Anukulyena Krishna Anushilanam Bhaktiya Uttama. So this is the ground verse for what is Uttam Bhakti. It's accepting what is favorable to Krishna, rejecting what is not. And Karm is rejected, Jnana is rejected if it's not focusing on Krishna. I'll read the translation here. Uttam Bhakti is the consummate endeavor. Do you know what consummate means? How do you put it? Inclusive. Huh? Inclusive. Yes. Correct. All inclusive. Is the all, that means all your energies are included in this endeavor. To serve Sri Krishna. All of your energy is invested to serve Krishna. In a favorable mood. It's like it's given the example by Rupa Goswami that there's Abhyapti and Atibhyapti. Kangsa was ordering Chanura and Mustika to fight with Krishna. Krishna was very happy to have wrestled with these big guys. He likes to fight in the fields of Braj. So he was happy. But was Mustika and Charana, Charan, were they performing Bhakti? No. Were they performing Bhakti? No, they were trying to kill him. So that's not bhakti. But still Krishna was happy. So if it's just to bring Krishna happiness, is not the criterion. This is what Rupa Goswami said. And what about Mother Yashoda? She's feeding Krishna, then she puts him down. And Krishna was very unhappy. So is that bhakti by Mother Yashoda? This is like the overextension. There's the overextension of the rule and the underextension of the rule. So we have to know what is pure bhakti. We have to be able to discriminate. Mother Yashoda's bhakti is the highest Vatsalya Ras in existence. So high. Monumental. She put Krishna down because she had so much love for his well-being. She wanted to save the very special milk. She had milked these cows herself because she was fried with Krishna going stealing butter from all the other gopis. They were coming to complain to her every day. Your son, he's coming taking our butter and sweets. And she was thinking, is the butter in my house not good enough for him? Why does he go to other people's places for butter? And so she thought, today I will make such nice. So she had her own eight cows and she fed them special grasses for a long time and ladus and gore she would feed them so it would make sweet milk and now she was boiling this very precious milk and this precious milk was on the stove boiling and thinking why should i keep my life when mother yashoda has so much milk herself she has not one ocean or a hundred ocean or a million ocean but trillions of oceans of milk within her to give to baby Krishna. So much milk, unlimited milk she has. And Krishna, he has the capacity to drink unlimited milk. So you have this combination between the two. So the milk is thinking on the stove, what is the point of my life? Mother Yashoda, she has unlimited milk. I will just commit suicide. So the milk starts to boil over into the fire. Mother Yashoda didn't want that. No, she had a plan for this milk. So she quickly went, got some water and sprinkled it on. But in the meantime, Krishna became so angry. Why is my mother not allowing me to drink milk now? 
Krishna's God, you know, he's impatient. And all of a sudden his milk had been turned off. And he became so angry with mother, he picks up a stone. And he's very smart as well. He never loses his smartness. If he broke the yogurt pot at the top, only the top part would come out. But if he breaks it down the very bottom, all of the yogurt will come out. So he breaks it down the very bottom so that all the yogurt that he's churning comes out and spreads all across the floor. And then Krishna, he sees all this yogurt rushing out and he smiles. <laughs> it's described that he smiles. And when Mother Yashoda comes back and she catches him and she accuses him of breaking it, Krishna said, I didn't break it, your ankle bell hit against the side of it. Why are you accusing me? He lies. And this is supposed to be God? And he's lying and stealing? How can the Bhakta understand that? Even in later pastimes, how can the Bhakta understand that he takes other men's wives? All the way through, it seems like he's acting in such a way that he's not God. How are we going to reconcile all that? With your intelligence to feel comfortable and safe with it, to embrace it as the absolute supreme truth. There are many commentaries given by the Acharyas describing the nature of this, that actually we know that they were actually Krishna's wives. Because when Brahma stole the cowherd boys at Vatsavan, he told them, stole all the cow then Purumasi is saying, now is the best time to get married in the village for one year. So Krishna, he actually marries all of those gopis at that time, because he's the cowherd boy. He's manifested himself as those cowherd boys. So he marries all the gopis. So they're actually his wife. That's the material aspect of it. But transcendentally, they are his unlimited potencies. Because Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur, he describes, there are more than 300 billion gopis dancing in the Rasalila. 300 billion. These are all Krishna's shaktis. And they've all manifested from Sri Radhika to please Krishna. So they are his wives. And at the same time, they're not his wives. Because if they were his wives, there would be no parakya. So in one state of consciousness, they're not his wives. So this exciting exchange of parakya can manifest. Because in the spiritual world, this mood of unwedded um, uh, relationship is there. This parakya. And this is another reason why Mahaprabhu has advented. We sing that song every day. Jai Radhe, Jai Krishna, Jai Vrindavan. It's something. What's that? Parakya Ras, we sing. Parakya Bhave. Parakya Bhave. What's the rest of that line? I can't remember. Anyway, yes, if you can find it, tell me that line. <laughs> So Mahaprabhu has come to explain this parakya bhava. So these are the moods of Krishna. So for one who is immersed in his affection as a madhyam, thinking of Krishna, he's always thinking of all these pastimes all the time. His whole consciousness is swimming in all these. He's arranged his life where he can just focus and remember Radha. If he gets involved in politics, if he gets involved, I mean, institutional politics, if he gets involved in uh, building temples, if he gets involved in, you know, extensive gardening, so many other things, how is he going to remember these details so easily? We have to coach our bodies with our various adhikars through this birth. And whatever our adhikar is, we have to follow that. Adhikar means your ability, your eligibility. Right? You know what adhikar means. Qualification. It means, what can you do? Qualification. Qualification. Very good, yes. So we have to understand truthfully what is our qualification. And then we perform our various activities accordingly. But whatever our qualification is, we should be praying to have the inspiration to understand the nature of Mahaprabhu's advent and why he manifested to give us service to Radha and Krishna. Because in any situation, service is the principle. 
Service saves. Service is the symptom of love. Mm -hmm. Service must be there. But service under guidance. Under guidance of who? Under guidance ultimately of Guru and our whole Guru Varya. What were they all doing? What was all our Guru Varya doing? They were all writing books or performing their bhajan, chanting Hare Krishna like that. We should try to tune into them and ask them, what do they want us to do? What does Bhaktivinoda Thakur want us to do? He wants us to read this Jaiva Dharma every day. He wants us to hear these truths. So we should, I shouldn't talk so much. We should just read the truths here. Mm -hmm. So this, Anyabila Sita Shunyam. Uttama, shlok, Uttama Bhakti is the consummate endeavor to serve Krishna in a favorable mood. It is free from any other desire and is not covered by knowledge of impersonal Brahm, that's called Jiva, Brahm, Aikya Gyan, by the daily and periodic duties outlined in the Shmiti Shastras, that's karma, any type of karma, it's not covered by that, or by renunciation, yoga, sankhya, or other types of dharma. It's not covered. This pure Uttam Bhakti should not be, um, what do you call, uh, contaminated with these other considerations. We can't sit with the pure conception. Why not? You don't have to compromise your conception. You can sit with Shuddha Bhakti. You can sit with Nitya Dharma. No problem. If other people don't like it and don't agree, that's not your problem. That's their problem, isn't it? Don't make other people's problems your problem. Right? We have enough problems of our own, <laughs> you know, to deal with. We don't need to deal with other people's problems. Everyone has a problem in this world. It's Kali Yuga. There's no person who doesn't have some type of issue or some type of problem. But if you get overwhelmed with other people's problems and other people's, what they think of you, then you're going to be very distracted and sidetracked from falling into a place of meditation on just pure bhakti, right? Because it doesn't, because you are who you are, and who you are is absolutely beautiful. You don't need to change anything. You just need to add Krishna to it. Krishna in a Shastric sense though, not Krishna in a speculative sense, not how I think Krishna, but how does Bhakti Vinod Thakur think Krishna? How does Naratam Das think Krishna? How does Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur think Krishna? How does Bhakti Vinod Swami Prabhupada think Krishna? How does my Gurudev think Krishna? This is the principle. Bhakti that is imbued with such characteristics is first found in the sudden practices of a Madhyam Vaishnava and it extends up to the stages of Bhav and Prem. Yes, we hear that you cannot actually experience Prem in this body. This body will explode with the heat of prem. You can experience up to bhav, bhav bhakti. Yes, you can reach bhav bhakti, but you cannot physically reach prema bhakti. Bhav bhakti is the threshold. Shura shatva, visheshatma, prem suryavam, samyabhak. This bhav is the ray of the sun of prem. So this bhav is very, very high. It's beyond asakti. It's beyond ruchi. It's beyond nishta. These are very elevated stages. Bhav is very high stage. And that stage we can achieve in this birth, not Prem. The only characteristic in the Bhakti of the Kanishta is that of service to the deity with faith. So we've already discussed the Kanishta. He serves the deity with faith, but he doesn't serve the Vaishnava with the same faith. That's where he misses. He doesn't understand the Bhakta who Krishna loves so much that his service should be performed. Such a person does not have the characteristic of Uttam Bhakti, namely Anyabilasita Shunya, freedom from ulterior desires, Jnana Karmadi Anavrita, freedom from the coverings of impersonal knowledge and fruitive action, and Anakulyena Krishnanu Shilana, consummate endeavors to serve Krishna in a favorable mood. That's so wonderful, you know. 
to every single day just want to please Krishna. You wake up, the first thing you're thinking of your mind, how am I going to be able to connect by serving Krishna today? When you're serving someone, even in the material world, you naturally connect with them, don't you? If your service is sincere and done with affection, you're naturally making some relationship with them, naturally. What to speak of trying to bring Krishna pleasure? But how do you know how to bring Krishna pleasure without asking Guru? Because Guru is always with Krishna and Guru never leaves. Don't think if your Guru Maharaj has left this world that he's gone. There's an expression there written on that backpack. It says, uh, understand that I am closer to you than the air you breathe. Yes, above the fridge. There's one backpack with that verse on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So always know that Guru is there and he's waiting for us to be inspired to bring him pleasure. And he will always nudge us onto the right path and nudge us out of the negative path. Kanishta is considered to have become a Madhyam Vaishnava and a genuine Bhakta when Bhakti with these symptoms manifests in his heart. Prior to this stage, he is a Prakrita Bhakta, which means that he is only a semblance of a Bhakta, Bhakta Abhas. And yesterday we discussed the Pratibhimba Abhas and the Chaya Abhas. So very, very important point to appreciate. Am I a boss in Pratibhimba, which means like actually wanting something in heart for myself, or am I connected to the object with sincerity in Chaya? Very, very important. Which means that he is only a semblance of a bhakta. He's not even a, a bhakta, actually. <clears throat> Bhakta Abbas, or a semblance of a Vaishnava, Vaishnava Abbas. The word Krishnanu Shilana refers to Prem, love for Krishna, and it is qualified by the word Anukulyena. This refers to those things that are favorable to Krishna Prem, namely friendship with the Bhaktas, mercy towards the ignorant, and neglect of those who are inimical to these three items are also symptoms of a Madhyam Vaishnava. Okay? Absorbing all this? Got it? It's very beautiful. Clear. It's like science. A, B, C, D, E. They're very, very clear. These three uh, aspects. And then the fourth one is going to be neglect of those demonic Two, the second characteristic of a Madhyam Vaishnava is his friendship towards bhaktas, in whose hearts Shuddha Bhakti has appeared and who are submissive to Bhagavan's will. Kanishta Bhaktas are not Shuddha Bhaktas, fully submissive to Bhagavan, and they do not offer respect or hospitality to Shuddha Bhaktas. Therefore, Madhyam and Uttam Bhaktas are the only suitable people with whom to develop intimate relationships. So remember this. There's no need to... You can preach to the Kanishta if the Kanishta wants your company. If the Kanishta has faith in you as a devotee, then you can give him something. If he doesn't have faith in you and you're hammering him on the head trying to make him have faith in you, this is ridiculous. Because this path is only in the region of the heart. If it's not heartly based and someone is trying to coerce you or push you, press you, this expression, a man convinced against his will, is of the same opinion still. You can't pressure this, you can't push this bhakti, this devotion. It's something that is naturally imbued in the heart and can naturally flower. That means if you have a natural inclination for another devotee, then that is very good. If that devotee is not so advanced, then you can encourage him and give him. But don't be challenging, because that's not the path of bhakti. Bhakti is very sensitive. Bhakti is very soft. Bhakti is very charming, sweet. 
It's not harsh. In three successive years, the bhaktas of Kalinagram asked Sriman Mahaprabhu, what is a Vaishnava and what are the symptoms by which he can be recognized? Sri Mahaprabhu replied by instructing them about Uttam, Madhyam and Kanishta Vaishnavas. Now, according to the characteristics of his description, all three of those classes, as he has described them, meet the standards that I have defined for Madhyam and Uttam Vaishnavas. None of them correspond to the Kanishta Bhaktas, who are only capable of worshipping the deity form because they do not utter Shuddha Krishna Nam. Their chanting is known as Chaya Namabhas. Chaya Namabhas refers to a semblance of the pure name, obscured by ignorance and anartas, like the sun covered by clouds, which does not manifest its full brilliance. Mahaprabhu instructed Madhyam Adhikari Grihastha Vaishnavas to serve the three kinds of Vaishnavas, which he described as follows. One, from whose mouth Krishna Nam is heard, even once. One from whose mouth Krishna Nam is heard constantly. And one whose very sight spontaneously evokes the chanting of Sri Krishna Nam. All these three types of Vaishnavas are worthy of service. But this is not true of one who only utters Nama Bas and not Shuddha Krishna Nam. Only Vaishnavas who utter Shuddha Nam are worthy of service. Okay, I'm going to stop now. It's on the hour. All glories to Sri Guru and Sri Guranga. All glories to our Rupanu Guru Vaigya. All glories to Jaiva Dharma and Shiva Bhakti Vinod Thakur. Mancha Kalpa Thrubhyascha, Kripa Sindhavivacha, Patitanam Pavnibhyo, Vaishnava Ebhyo Namaha. Vaishnavas Ki Jai, Gopinandai Haribhyo.